And if you overstep that mark, they withdraw the mic. Now, um, yesterday Roger Hayes rang me up and said that although I've prepared a speech which would last an hour, I've only got 20 minutes. So what I've got to do is to eat a lot of my words. I can't even make my opening joke, although now I've said it's a joke, I'll make it. Which is, uh, what I was going to do is appear here with my left hand above my head, like uh, Boris Johnson, and uh, think, uh, say, what on earth am I doing here? Well, the answer is, I was ordered here by the police. Or rather by a uh, policeman you may have heard just now. And he got on the phone and uh, he badgered me to turn up. I was a bit reluctant, I seem to recall, simply because I'd been engaged in some rather delicate work on behalf of our cousins in the United States. And it's been quite a dangerous work. And as um, Mr. Hilger is here, I just want to make uh, a few points about this. Because what I have been doing, and it's a, it arose as a, as a consequence of a whole series of um, events which we needn't go into, uh, is that we have been exposing the biggest corruption story in the history of the world, uh, which is basically surrounded, um, concerns the derivatives operation. Uh, all derivatives are fraudulent finance activities. And as a direct result, of this activity, which you can see displayed on my website, which is www.worldreports.org. Sorry to plug it, but I have to. Um, the United States moved this week onto the Basel II norms, which means that all off-balance sheet transactions are illegal, and, um, which means that the entire derivative sector is worth zilch. Now, the reason that the pound in your pocket is a piddly little, little coin, which you can't even buy the Daily Telegraph with, is precisely because this leveraging and hypothecation of fraudulent finance activity has been taking place. Now, it um, was originated in the bowels of the, what I call the US intelligence power, um, and the proxy name for that is the CIA, but actually we're referring to 16, possibly 18 uh, agencies which are a subsidiary to the CIA, including the FBI. And this fraudulent finance uh, operation uh, originated when money became digitized or was, uh, ceased to be more than just an entry on a, on a bank statement or a balance sheet. And um, the brains behind this is Dr. Henny Kissinger, also known as Heinz, who you may recall still has a very, very big German accent. He still has it. Now the reason for this is of course that he's a triple agent. His uh, Soviet code name is BOR, quite well known. We don't know what his uh, pan-German code name is. But uh, the reason I've mentioned this is that I'm going to talk about Germany. Now, in the first um, peroration, we were told about the Germans when they took us over about 1,200 years ago. Well, they're engaged in the same operation. Because contrary to the general view, we did not win the war. What happened was we finished Hitler off. We personalized the war, so we thought that when Hitler ceased to exist ostensibly. I don't believe these stories about the fact that he survived the bunker, that's nonsense. We thought we'd won the war, but that is not what happened. In practice, what happened was that in about 1941, it was in 1941, at the Wannsee Conference, the Nazi intelligentsia realized that there must be a 50-50 chance that the Germans would lose the war. And so what they did was they exported their big brains to Madrid. And in 1942, they set up what, it, what they called the German Geopolitical Center. And if you go back into that part of history, you'll see that um, it is quite often mentioned that all the big hotels in Madrid were full of Gestapo 
and Germans. Now, the German geopolitical center did nothing but think about what would happen if Germany didn't succeed in taking over Europe. And in other words, it was a long-term think tank and they developed a long-range deception strategy. The long-range deception strategy was originally set, up, set out in a, uh, a work or a, um, a book of seminars or a, a seminar document called Europäische Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, European Economic Community, published in 1942 in Berlin, which is mentioned in my book, The European Union Collective, details of which are out there. The subtitle for European Union Collective, which was published in, 19, in 2002, so it's seven years old, but it's still entirely relevant, is enemy of its member states. The European Union is, of course, not our friend, it is our enemy, and has been all along, because its purpose is to usurp our sovereignty and take us over. And in fact, what we now have... What we now have, in fact, is a rubber stamp parliament, which, as you know, I think about 82% of stuff that comes into the House of Commons originates in uh, Brussels. Now, what happened was that in, under Heath, we handed over general powers to an unelected group in Brussels, which is a self-perpetuating situation. And the real problem with this enemy of ours is that it is on autopilot. In fact, if you, I bought the wrong newspaper this morning, but if you do happen to pick up a copy of the, the Guardian, you'll see this ghastly picture in the middle where all these creeps are sort of embracing each other. They love it. They can't, you know, it, it's a big club. They're very happy with each other. And of course, Blair's got a major problem because although the previous speaker mentioned his uh, candidacy as president of the European Union, in fact, you will have seen in the paper yesterday that his uh, campaign peaked too early now, the reason it peaked too early is connected with the developments in the United States. Because this week, and I, don't, I will not go on about this because it's not the subject, but this week, uh, the United States did switch to the Basel II basis, which precludes all this uh, criminal finance. Now, um, I'm going to say something which is not publicized. This struggle to get the United States to cut out this corruption has been going on for years. I came in on it in about 2005. And you'll see my website is absolutely chock full of this stuff. The problem was, or has been, that A, the people running the criminal finance, including, of course, the criminal enterprises, and by the way, I have referred to Citibank and other very large uh, banks in the United States as criminal enterprises for the last two and a half years and I'm still walking and the reason for that is that if you go into the main courthouse in New York and you pull up Citibank you would have to spend about three weeks taking down information about the court cases concerning Citibank and fraud which are still before the court and that's just one court. Anyway, what happened this week is that the Chinese have made available to the United States or to the Federal Reserve 10 metric tons of gold. It's been loaned to them, it's a sort of loan, but of course there are huge strings attached. And it's no coincidence that Hillary Clinton, who is up to her neck in this corruption, as you will know from the Clinton background, uh, it, it has suddenly said that friendship with China is my personal mission, okay? Well, the reality is that the United States couldn't go Basel II uh, unless it, the, its currency was properly based, and the Chinese have made available 10 metric tons of gold for that purpose on a loan basis. Um, it's a very complex subject, but I'm trying to tell you something, which is that the corruption that I may still have time to talk about 
in the European context is mirrored in the United States. And in fact, what we're talking about is a two-pronged attack on the main enemy. The main enemy, according to the Germans and the Soviets, is Britain and the United States. Now, the, the prong against Britain, the main weapon against Britain is the European Union Collective. And the weapon against the United States is the penetration of the CIA and its affiliates with the, the German uh, Himmler scientists and intelligence officers who were brought over after the denazification program was scrapped in 1946. Um, and if you look up, look up Operation Paperclip, that was the first major um, transfer of Nazis into the United States. So about 700 families went on under Operation Paperclip, but it went on and on and on right the way to the beginning of the 50s. So what happened was that the um, US intelligence power was taken over to some extent, or to a considerable extent, by a German Nazi fifth column who have been running the show ever since. Now, Kissinger uh, is, I believe, the key to this, and he may, uh, was instrumental in persuading uh, President Ford to dismiss um, William Colby as DCI, the Director of Intelligence, uh, in favor of George H.W. Bush. Now, George Bush is the representative in the United States of Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, which is the German black agency based, believe it or not, in Dachau. And um, we call it DVD. I exposed DVD. It's nothing to be proud about because we've known about it for years. But I publicized it, and I know for a fact that certain intelligence officers from DVD have actually congratulated elements of MI6 uh, on this exposure, because they think I'm MI6, which is, of course, complete rubbish. Anyway, um, the point is this, that the uh, German operate, the, the operation against the United States has been run by DVD in Dachau, behind the scenes, and the same applies to the operation against the United Kingdom. Now, the DVD is self-financing, like the CIA, through fraudulent finance, and it, um, it, it advises the German Chancellor about its activities, but the German Chancellor can't tell it what to do, quote, unquote. The DVD is running our lives and is the enemy within the enemy, okay? Now, given that um, the German geopolitical center set out the program. Uh, how do we know that this is the case? We know it from a document called the, which has been called the Madrid Circular Letter, which was intercepted in about, um, I think it was 1951, by the Allies. Uh, this was a document being sent to the other Nazi centers in Buenos Aires, Cairo, Tehran, I think, and various other places, Tokyo, from Madrid by the German Geopolitical Center. And this document contains the following slogan, Für uns ist der Krieg niemals vorbei. For us, the war never ended. Now, one of my correspondents, Jack Christella, who is um, of British, he's British, but he's of German-Jewish extraction, uh, emailed me a very, very intelligent um, analysis and said that he thought that what they really meant was Für uns ist der Krieg nimmer vorbei. For us, the war never ended. I think that's true. I think that's correct. I think that's what they actually mean. In other words, they are Trotskyites. They are Mao Zedong, perpetual war advocates. Now, um, so we have the problem that we're dealing actually not just, I mean, I've called the European Union our enemy, European Union collective, but within the collective is, of course, Germany, and that's the problem. Now, uh, if I had time, I would have told you what I wanted to tell you, which is to, I wanted to proceed what I was going to say with a little scripture lesson. But I'll skip most of it, and I'll just... Uh, read verse 1 of Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. 
That's the point. Where is the Lord to be seen in this structure? It is totally a spiritual. It has no spiritual content at all. Excuse me? I'm a father of four daughters. We know that it's not just a question of our physical existence. We have a spirit as well. This entity is not connected at all to our spiritual existence because it is of Satan. And I'm absolutely clear about that. There is no question. Psalm 53, verse 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now the point here is, who is the author of lies and confusion? What is the European Union collective but confusion? The successive treaties which are run every three or four years are just updated versions, but if you look at them very carefully, and I know this because I worked with Bill Cash in 1992 uh, against the Maastricht Treaty, at the beginning, you know, uh, sort of paragraph 48, little one, subsection C, you'll see one statement, and then way down, 40 pages later, you've got that contradicted. That is the Soviet technique. That was exactly what happened in, under the Soviet Constitution. Rights are given, rights are taken away, and so, and so on and so forth. It's the same. And there is a, a to an absolute parallel, because if you walk into the European Parliament, which I had privilege to do, because I had a friend who is no longer an MEP, but I uh, was there several times. If you walk in there, you can see you are walking into the Soviet, the Supreme Soviet. It's the same design. All they have to do is to remove the blue stars, or the yellow stars on the blue background, and substitute the uh, hammer and sickle. Now, on the corruption point, you will be aware that the accounts of the European Commission have been specifically disapproved by the EU's own Court of Auditors for the past 14 years running. Okay? So this means that the last time that the European Commission had accounts which could be relied upon, quote unquote, was 15 years ago. Now, I've been running my own private company since 1963. If I produce false accounts. Um, excuse me, I think something very serious happens to me. I'll probably get the bar and I may go to jail. These people have been producing false accounts for the last 14 years and no one is paying any attention. I want to draw your attention to the following reality. In order to correct this matter, they have to go back 15 years and they have to look at every single transaction that took place 14 years ago. They have to identify the fraud or anything that was irregular. They have to have that corrected, however that can be done. They have to have the perpetrators reported to law enforcement and the law enforcement has to proceed with uh, the appropriate measures. That has to happen 14 years ago. Then when they've corrected the 14th year, they go to the 13th year, and so on and so forth, right the way up to the present. Is that going to happen? No way, Jose, it's never going to happen. Okay? That's obvious. Therefore, the European Commission is a criminal enterprise. Now, my, I have a, a new Irish friend who's absolutely delightful called Richard Sharp, with an E. He comes through from uh, Ireland periodically in the, on the way to the continent because he has to drive. And um, he does odd jobs for me in Europe. It's very, very convenient. And about uh, two months ago, he drove, he said, I'll go to the Court of Auditors and uh, I'll look him up. So he literally did a cold call to the Court of Auditors, which is the EU's so-called auditing entity, in Luxembourg. And he got to see a Mr. Giza Novaks, N-O-V-A-C-S. And Mr. Giza Novaks specifically confirmed, and by the way, I'm mentioning his name so that you know I didn't make this up, okay? 
You can ring him up and he'll have to say, you have to confirm that what I've just said is accurate. He confirmed that, yes, the European Commission's accounts have not been approved for the past 14 years. The European Commission is a criminal enterprise. Let me introduce my friend who was set up, by the way, Ashley Moat, MEP, who is a close personal friend and is an absolutely delightful man. He stepped down as MEP for South East England uh, in June. And virtually the last thing he did was to go to see the Serious Fraud Office. Now in 2005, he had previously been to see the Serious Fraud I think it was maybe in 2006, He'd previously been to see the Serious Fraud Office with uh, two large files, copies of which I hold. These files contain detailed allegations of criminal fraud committed by at least one enterprise, and I think there are several, uh, which are registered in England and Wales, uh, which did or do business with the European Commission. The European Commission awarded 53 further contracts to this entity, notwithstanding the fact that it had been caught uh, uh, in fraudulent activities. So Ashley compiled all this information with a lot of other stuff and presented it to the Serious Fraud Office. He knew that nothing would happen and he had TV cameras and uh, journalists outside and lo and behold he was given the brush off. But almost his last job before leaving was to do the same thing all over again. And on this occasion, he was given a very high level interview with a man called Paul Craig. I mention the name for the same reason as I mentioned Mr. Novak's name. So that if anybody has any problems here, they can ring up the Serious Fraud Office and speak to Paul Craig and ask him whether what Christopher Stories just said and what uh, Ashley Moat says on his website is true or false. Well, of course it's true. Now what happened was, the following, at the end of the three-hour discussion, Ashley Moat, which is typical of him, said, have I been wasting my time here today? Paul Craig, no. Ashley Moat, is it a criminal offence to pass public money to an organisation known to be corrupt? Paul Craig, yes. Right. The Serious Fraud Office has agreed that taxpayers' money should not be handed to a criminal enterprise. Excuse me? What this means is that the Serious Fraud Office has been told that funds belonging to the taxpayer are being handed to a criminal enterprise, because that's one of the subjects that uh, Ashley raised with him on this occasion. The Serious Fraud Office is supposed to be engaged in rooting out serious fraud, but it's not doing its job. Now, it's worse than that. It gets worse. And the reason it's worse is that the British government is handing over your money, our VAT money, to a criminal enterprise. But excuse me, the Serious Fraud Office has stated that this is a criminal offence. It therefore follows not only that the European Commission is a criminal enterprise indefinitely because it cannot correct its accounts, it also follows that the British government is engaged in defrauding you, the taxpayer, on an ongoing basis and will continue to do so. The British government is engaged in criminal fraud. It is a co-conspirator and an accessory to the fact of handing over British taxpayers' money to a criminal enterprise. This is ludicrous. It needs to be dealt with. Now, I have a solution to this. There's a very easy solution. And the solution, I've got two minutes and it just fits perfectly. The solution is that the VAT money should, by administrative fiat of the government, be redirected to a special account at the Treasury. Do we need to tell Brussels this? No. Wouldn't bother to tell them. What I would do is just reallocate the funds into the Treasury. After all, they've got a certain 
financial problem, have they not? These funds are not insubstantial. Within three years, the Treasury's problems will be finished. For that reason alone, 15, 20 billion would be very happily received at the Treasury. Okay, that's not enough, but never mind. Now, all they have to do is to have the funds redirected. If Brussels gets uptight, the Treasury says, well, your accounts have not been in order for the last 14 years. We have been advised that it's a criminal offence for us to forward funds to you. We have ceased to do so. What's your problem? Now, finally, the Treasury could say, if the Treasury wants to be nice to the Germans, which I don't think is a good idea, but they want to be nice to the Germans, you can say, look, you've got, we'll, we'll give you two years to put your accounts, to, put, to get Brussels to put its accounts right. You've got two years, and at the end of two years, if it's not right, we, the Treasury, annexes the funds in perpetuity, but I wouldn't even give them that. I would just re-channel the money straight away so that the British government is no longer committing fraud against you, the taxpayer, and so that we are no longer paying our taxes into the hands of a criminal enterprise. Thank you very much.